it was a busy day today we we um, had gone for the burial the burial of uh, the father to brother Pepheus. I believe some of you attended the funeral. We were with him on Saturday and um, he didn't really look like uh, he would die. He was looking strong and um, we had a word of prayer with him and it really wasn't in our hearts that uh, would hear the news that uh, he has died. It, it shows how fragile our lives are. Uh, one moment we are together, another moment someone is no more, you know. Like uh, the relative to Brother Nzima who, who only had a headache and then what happens the, the following day? Uh, is it the same day? Yeah, he goes for work in the morning then later on you know the news you receive that someone has died and well usually when you think about death it's so easy to think when it happens on another person but really it's very close to each one of us we are really very fragile beings you know when an accident occurs and then you see the sight of blood spilling you realize that we are just pints of blood. And once it spills over, then uh, you are no more. And uh, when you think about it deeply, every human being, if they were to think seriously about death, just the thought of it needs to bring someone on his knees to go in the presence of his creator. It should bring a certain reflection, a certain sounding in your mind that life can't just be, we wake up, we grow up, we eat, we get busy, then we die, then it ends there. Because when you die, you lose out all the achievements you made. Building project, business, your academic pursuits. When death comes, all that is buried with you, isn't it? You know, and to me that is very important. And uh, let me just read this scripture. And there's something I wanted to read from um, this history book, which I I got when I was in Singapore. <clears throat> and I know we we were supposed to start Genesis, but uh, just pardon me, it, it's really been a week of activity. So I haven't yet prepared for that study, but I thought of encouraging you with this portion um, from Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Now, this is quite very true. If, if life is all about the pursuits we have, academic pursuits, you want to get a diploma, next time you want to get a degree, a master's degree, you want a better pay, and, and sometimes you really look forward to something to say, if I can just get a pay raise, or if I can get a promotion, you feel like I'll be happy. But have you ever realized that when you get what you were looking for, suddenly it's not as exciting as you thought it would be? How many have ever experienced that? Yeah, you were really looking towards something. Then once it comes in your hands, you realize it's not as exciting as you anticipated it. Now that is not to say work is not important. Academics are not important. No, no. Um, Whatever your hands find to do, do it diligently with all your heart, with all your mind, whether it is academics, pursuit of business. But the thing of it is, our purpose of existence are not to be found in those things. Those things are just the means, so to speak of, which should help us fulfill and achieve the purpose why God put us here on this planet. 
But the problem which is there is people make a purpose in something which should help them, which should point to the actual purpose that actually God put them on earth. You know, it's like uh, when you are eating an orange. An orange is a very sweet fruit, very nice, very tasty in the mouth. But you eat an orange not for the sake of the taste. Actually, the real purpose of the orange begins once you swallow it. When you no longer feel the taste and it's down in your stomach and digestion begins. If a person begins to buy food because of the taste, that person will ruin his health because... He'll go after junk food because junk food is tasty. You know, these nicely cooked fried chickens and all that, very tasty food. So if the purpose of food is mistaken for taste, well, you end up eating wrong food because that's not the purpose of food. The purpose of food is for it to give you energy. And its purpose, when it starts taking place in the stomach, thus there's no excitement to eat to the process of digestion. You don't even feel it. It occurs in silence. And then the food gets digested, broken down, and it gets assimilated into your, into your bloodstream. And really, that is what is happening in real life, where we work so that we can have money, and then this money needs to put food on the table so that we can have money to build a house. But is that all there is to life? Is, is that the purpose why God created a wonderfully made being like you? Is that really the purpose why God has put a very complex system which hangs in space, which we call the earth and orbiting around the sun? God has far greater, he, 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 he has a great purpose than what man has made out of life. And when people reduce the meaning of life to eating, looking for a better job, getting married, later on they die, and then all that they gained for in life ends in the grave. If that is all what life is about, then really it's a very meaningless cycle of events. But you and I, we've been woken up to the revelation of God. Our eyes were opened that there is a creator. He put us on this earth for a purpose and there is something which goes beyond the grave. And really man has always had this conscience about it. Man has always been conscious about there has to be something beyond the primary things we see in our environment. You know, when I was in Singapore, I bought this book. It's a history book. I was just going through the, the books. I usually love when I travel to a country, I, I just go to a good bookshop and I see what good books they may have which I can't access here or which I haven't seen on the internet. And so I was going through the shelves and I was wondering what book I would get for my flight, which would keep me, me busy reading. And I found this book, very nice one. If you can, you can get it. It says, uh, A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich. And very simple to read. There are no big words in it. And uh, the author is really ta ta uh, talented at, you know, making history sound interesting because many times I remember when we were learning history in school it sounded so boring reading about you know how academic textbooks are but he has put uh, his texts in a very uh, what you call sort of like a conversation he's telling you a story and it really becomes interesting and he was talking about I was reading this chapter where he talks about Egypt and how what motivated Egyptians to um, to start um, what is this word for preserving the body? Mummification. Yeah, to make these mummies, huh? where they um, embalm. Okay, you know Egyptians had this belief that uh, there is a soul in the body, like you and I believe, but 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 then there was. A strange item to their doctrine. Uh, let me just read this portion of what they believed about the date. Um, yeah, this is on page 12. He says, 
The most important part of the Egyptians' strange religion was their belief that although a man's soul left his body when he died, for some reason the soul went on needing that body and would suffer if it crumbled into dust, you know, if it broke down and then worms came out of it and then it was no more. So they believed uh, the soul which departs out of that body, it is going to suffer if that body is destroyed. So they invented a very ingenious way of uh, so they invented a very ingenious way of preserving the bodies of the dead. They rubbed them with ointments and the juices of certain plants and bandaged them with long strips of cloth um, so that they so that they wouldn't decay. A body preserved in this manner is called a mummy. And that is how they, they, they started this thing of embalming so that you can preserve you know, the state of the body. And really that shows human beings have always had the fear of death. But they've also had this thing in their minds to know that consciousness is something unique. It can't end in the grave. This is a belief you find among different religions. Okay, and the, the human soul has this belief, he has this sense that makes him know that consciousness is not something that ends in the, in the grave. And of course, by the truth of God's word, we also know that life doesn't end in the grave. Of course, Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses, they have a different belief on that, where they believe you cease to exist when you go in the grave because the air goes into the air, I mean, uh, your breath goes into the air, the body decomposes and it returns to dust. But of course, scripturally, we know that can't be. Because uh, when you read story, story that Jesus gives of Lazarus, when he died, the Bible says he went into the bosom of Abraham. And that can't be a parable. It can't be a parable because he mentions a name. In a parable, you don't mention a name that there was a man called Lazarus. He is narrating an event which occurred. Okay, and uh, when he died, he went in the bosom of Abraham. And well, even if it was a parable, Jesus wouldn't use something which is uh, a pagan illustration to emphasize a truth. If you say of a soul uh, being different from a body comes from pagans, how could Jesus use a pagan example to illustrate the truth of God? The Bible speaks of when Jesus was buried when he was taken in that tomb. He went to souls in prison to preach, you know, to the souls who were bound in prison. And of course, he wasn't preaching to them that repent now and all that. But when you read Ephesians 4 verse 11, it says, uh, he that ascended is the one who also uh, descended. He, he took those who were in captivity and laid them captive. They became his captives because at one time they were held in captivity of sure, you know, and death is a reality, but so is our consciousness. And if life continues after the grave, we know that life has a greater purpose than what we can pursue in this physical world. And that is why as long as a person is not born again, hasn't given his life to God, hasn't come to the realization that there is a creator and this creator has a purpose and his purpose is in the word. If a person hasn't come to that realization, he will, he will abuse his life. Abuse means abnormal use. That is why you have people drinking. That's why you have people going in prostitution. Even people who think I'm good, I don't insult, I don't drink and all that, they still abuse their lives because they've reduced their lives to a level not different from an animal. Eating, pursuing one's man-made dreams, and then after, after that, what? You still haven't woken up to the reality of fulfilling the purpose of him that created you. As long as a thing is not being used according to the purpose for what it was made, it is good as though that thing never existed. And that is why at the end of everything, the Bible speaks of hell. 
And well, there's this doctrine that people will burn forever and ever in hell. That is not true. Hellfire will burn people to a point of non-existence, where at a certain point they'll have to be annihilated. And that is why when you read in the book of Malachi, this verse speaks of annihilation. And annihilation means you completely go out of existence. So we don't know how long people exist in hell, but one thing is certain, they won't continue living and burning and all that. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud year, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root, nor what? Nor branch. Now, um... You have a body, and inside that body, you have the spirit of life in you. There is a spirit of life in you. And there is consciousness where you know that this is me, I am here, I'm walking, I'm thinking, consciousness. But that consciousness cannot exist without the spirit of life of God. It needs to have life for it to exist. Your feelings, your, your I mean, sorry, your, your thoughts... Your imaginations, that feeling that, or that awareness that I am, that can't exist without the spirit of life. Now, if you have an accident or you have a disease, the only separation that takes place is your soul separates from your body. And in that soul, there's a spirit of life. So, when... Someone comes out of his body. That is just the first death, you know. And that death separates the soul from the body. Now, I can, a human being can do that on you. If I take a knife, stab you, that will bring about the separation of your soul and your body. But that doesn't mean you've gone out of existence. There is a second death. And that second death, only God can bring it about. That is when the spirit of life departs from the soul. That means your awareness, your consciousness goes out of existence. Uh, let us read this scripture. Uh, Matthew 10 verse 28. Now, and this is where There are a lot of uh, inconsistencies in the doctrine that says life is all about your breath and your body of dust so that when you are buried, you cease to exist. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Now, can you see there's the death of the body and there's the death of the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you see that the second death will occur in hell. The second death will occur in hell when life departs from the soul. And let's read uh, Revelation chapter... Chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was, sorry, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, let's go to Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews 4 verse 12. 
Now for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, earthly swords or weapons, they can only cause death, which separates the body from the soul. But God's word is so powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. And what does it do? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Can you see that? The soul, where your thoughts are, your awareness is, it can only live because of the spirit of life in it. But when the spirit of life Leaves the soul. That's the end. That's non-existence. Your consciousness is gone. Now can you imagine? Looking at the things we've spoken. What's the most important aspect of you? Is it the body? No, it can't be. The body is just your house. It's just your tabernacle. Right? But do you realize much of what we do, we spend more time feeding the flesh. <laughs> I mean, think of your, your whole day today. You have to eat three times a day, huh? feeding what? The flesh. You need to make a very good house where, I mean, our persons want to make a comfortable environment, good house where you, you can live in comfortably. And that is what, why we wake up early in the morning working so that you can have a salary, you want to have food. But really, can all that labor be reduced to the purpose of taking care of the body. The body is just a house. It's a temple. But there is something in you that defines who you are. Your thoughts, your imaginations. And if your soul is not converted, it becomes polluted. And at the end of it all, it means your soul is abusing the spirit of life which God put in you. Because that spirit of life is like energy which God has deposited in you to enable you to live and manifest his purpose here on earth. But that energy can be wasted on things that don't really matter in the eyes of God. And that is why now, going back to the scripture that we read in Psalm 127, these are quite very deep words which are written in this psalm. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, can you imagine when you look at a child? We invest so much time in these children. I mean, we part away with our salaries. If I look at the education my parents gave me, yeah, they invested something. But as time moves on, I look at the money I'm investing in the school for Joshua and later on for Terry. The amount of fees you pay, it's quite very high because you want the best for your child. In other words, you are building your children. You are trying to build their future. That is right, isn't it? Now, can you imagine after all those efforts that your child turns out into a hooligan? How would it make you feel? Every now and then you hear your child stole from some place. Your child did this and that. Your child ran away from school. Or your daughter has become impregnated. If any parent who has ever gone through that, it must be very heartbreaking. Because you are looking at all the things you invested in that life. It's like it was all in vain. Isn't it? And now look at this scripture. That is how God, our Heavenly Father, looks at us. Every day, He gives you life. God has invested a certain energy in you. A certain talent in you. There's something God has put in each of us. But except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Think of the city as your life. I mean, every now and then you want to guard your life. You want to eat properly. You want to... If you, if you are walking on the road, I mean, you, 
you don't want to be bashed by a car. You are keeping guard of your city, huh? of your life. Just like every other person does. Even a thief is so careful about his life. He wants, uh, you know, he won't walk carelessly on the road so that he can be hit by a vehicle. He treasures his life. No one wants to die. But if a person hasn't woken up to the realization of the purposes and the mysteries of God, all that watching over your life becomes in vain. Why? At the end of it all, when you die, the story ends there. Yeah, you ate very nice food, but the energy in that food ends up rotting in the soil, and then your whole body and all the complex cells you had, you know, they've just decomposed. If really life was ending in the grave, it's really a useless piece in the story of the universe. It is vain for you to rise up early. Without God, everything becomes vanity. It's vain for you to rise up early. I mean, if all there is to life is just way up to the grave, I would prefer an early exit through suicide. Because it doesn't make a difference, isn't it? It means everything loses its meaning. It's, it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. But we believe there is more to the story. And in this book, again, I was reading something uh, on page, uh, this should be page 18. He's describing how life was in the, what that time was called Meso Mesopotamia, somewhere in the Middle East, where Iraq is. There is this tribe of people which was called the Sumerians and they were quite ahead in some things. The way they would make bricks, the way they would make very nice, beautiful structures. And he says this on page 18, this author. In some respects, the Sumerians were ahead of the Egyptians. Excavations of rubble mounds on plains near the Persian Gulf have revealed that the people living there had already learned how to shape bricks from clay and build houses and temples by 3100 BC. Deep inside one of the largest of these mounds were found the ruins of the city of Ur, where, so the Bible tells us, Abraham was born. A great number of tombs were also found that appeared to date from the same time as Cheops' great pyramid in Egypt. But while the pyramid was empty, these tombs were packed with the most astonishing treasures, Dazzling golden headdresses and gold vessels for sacrifices, gold helmets and gold daggers set with semi-precious stones, magnificent harps decorated with bulls' heads and, would you believe it, a game board beautifully crafted and patterned like a chessboard. The explorer who found these treasures took many of them to England, where you can see them in the British Museum. Others are in the University of Pennsylvania and the M Museum of Baghdad in Iraq. Now think of it, I was reading this portion and I was thinking, wow, they found these structures, the historians and uh, you know, the people who dig up these things. And these structures are old. But as they started unearthing them, they found pieces of gold. They found beautiful things. Now, do you know that at one time, what today we see as the remains of the Sumerian culture. At one time, there was a person who really treasured those bracelets of gold. And at one time, there was a person to which these things belonged. He protected, he guarded them. You know, that's why they were found in a certain way. He never wanted them to be stolen. But today, where are these treasures? <laughs> in a museum. Does anyone remember who was the owner of this? No. The person is no more, but the precious stones have remained. And life can't be about these earthly treasures. It can't be. Because the moment, right now, your degree gives you a certain identity. Eh? But when you die, <laughs> that paper is no more. The CV is no more. It can only be said we used to have 
Dr. So and so. We used to have so and so. So if we attach our value in the form of things that we can accumulate in this world, and we make the beginning and end of our purposes in these things, then really our life is not different from a rabbit which is busy in some bush somewhere. But human beings, we are different from animals. We are different from all creation. Why? We have this thing called free will. We have this thing, a certain consciousness, which is way beyond that of an animal. Why? In Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. There is something in us that mirrors the way God is. And God desired a family. And what is this family up to? We can only find the purpose of this family, not in the family itself, not in the wonderful, beautiful gifts the family has been given, but in the father of all creation. That's where we can find the purpose of our existence. But how beautiful and how wonderful it is when someone wakes up to the reality and the revelation of God. It means every small piece of work you do finds meaning now. It means whatever career you have, it becomes purposeful because it is connected to the great purposes of God. Think of your body. Your body is made up of so many parts. There is a nail, there is this, there is that and all that. But do you realize that if I chop off a piece here, let's say there's a problem if it is chopped off. When the doctor throws it in the trash can, that thing has lost its purpose because it's no longer attached to my body mechanism. Because whatever portion is part of your body can only find its purpose by being attached to the body. And that is why when someone is detached from God, no matter how rich he can be, no matter how he can prosper, no matter how he can be so much prominent, as long as you are detached from God, your purpose ceases. Your life becomes vain. Amen. Amen. So I was meditating and I was thinking on those words and Amen. words came rolling back when I thought about the funeral we, when we buried the father to Brother Pepheus, you know, and he just died a sudden death and of course, he was sick, but we never expected he would go. And I was looking at the crowd which gathered at the funeral, quite a very big crowd. And this is a place I've been to several times. I've attended so many funerals. And every now and then we bury another person, we bury another person. But you know, the reality which is there is, one day it will be another crowd who will escort you. It's you who is going to be dead. I mean, that's a fact of life. And I was telling Brother Monster that, you know what? Death happens every day. Every now and then we come to this place. But see Jairika. <laughs> it's not something you can say we are used to it. And so when it comes on you, you'll be used to it. And when we go to a place like that, the words of Solomon really make sense when he says, going to a house of funeral is better than going to a party. You know why? Because when you go to a house of funeral, that echo will come back and hit you in the head to say, so one day I'll end up like that. But in the house of parting, you know what is there? The flesh is in total control and people are celebrating and having a good time. When the flesh is celebrating, many times human beings are detached from reality. But when you go through UTH, that hospital, and you see people are in deep pain, People are dying. That's when you see the real face of the world because when you see another person dying, it reminds you, I'll be like this someday. Right? One day, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord tarries, we are praying for his coming, but if the Lord tarries, one day we'll bury. We don't know who will go here first. Is it not strange? <laughs> I remember speaking this very sentence, statement, when Sister Mary used to be alive. And I said, you know what? It may be you, Sister Mary. It may be me one day, but one day we'll go through the grave. And she said, well, I'm praying I go in the rapture. But that's not the reality. The reality is she left us so many years ago. She was very passionate about God. She loved God so much. 
but God appointed. I, I, I still remember that day. We were actually laughing to say, well, can you imagine brothers and sisters? We don't know who go here first. And at that time she was in good health. But she's no more. And I spoke those words so many years ago. So many years ago. And I still speak these same words. Next time it may be Brother Smata. Next time it may be Brother Nzima. Next time it may be my wife. Or it could be me. I can start first. But the thing of it sense is when one person leaves us. You, you, you know, death is very simple when it's on another person. But think of you've married someone for a long time. Or it's your child. And you are used every time you are in the house, someone comes, is in the chair. But one day, that chair, it will be an empty chair one day. One day, that bed where you sleep with your spouse, one day, that portion will be empty. That's the reality of life which many times we always try to keep ignoring. But you know what? When we give our lives to God, our life experiences meaning. Our life wakes up to reality. It is a wonderful thing to be in his presence and to think about the Lord and for our lives to be hid with Christ and God. Amen. I just thought of encouraging you with this. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you help us always to always remember of your grace, to always remember of why you've given us this life. It has to be a constant consciousness that we need to have, Lord. Just as life or breath doesn't get tired in us, we don't want to get tired speaking about life, speaking about things which really matter in this life. Forgive us, Lord, and have mercy on us. We pray for all the other believers who are not here. As they gather in their homes, remember them, Father. We pray for the family of Brother Pepheus, who laid their father today. Uh, their mother was so depressed, even the young brother to Brother Pepheus. And really, Lord, it's, it's always something that touches our lives when a loved one has departed from us. And it strikes reality back in our faces. But Father, we don't want to just be waking up to this reality when it's a funeral. But may it be our daily life to be always conscious and present. To know that there is a creator who's given our hearts the strength to keep pumping. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.